How's it going guys? Welcome back to the Blue Shelter and welcome back to Seabed, where we've kind of figured out kind of what's going on. Uh, we're still seeing a lot of exploration of uh, Sachiko's mind palace or mind realm, whatever you call to call it. So Narasaki is still kind of around, but she seems to be intent on doing something particular and she seems to be, her mission was to go find Takako, who apparently exists within Sachiko's mind. So you think about it, it makes sense. I mean, she was drawing on memories and kind of cultivating her personality from somewhere. Uh, we also kind of learned that Dr. Narsaki kind of has a middle space between the two worlds, uh, where um, she has her own office. Sometimes it's in Tokyo, sometimes it's in the sanatorium. Uh, little Magi kind of came on, and uh, his quote here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. He makes some references specifically to times in the video. Like, I recommend you check it out. Uh, but his ending paragraph, I think, was very telling. I'm just, uh, I want to share that real quick, where he said, Honestly, this episode is particularly the reason why I kept saying to pay attention to the backgrounds. As we saw in this video, Takiko's environment is based on what Sachiko sees in reality. In fact, the sanatorium starts with a few details, but gets more filled as Sachiko spends more time in the ma ma uh, mansion in. Best example? Compare the image of Takiko's room Narasaki's visited, he uh, visited here versus the room Sachiko woke up in the end of the video. Less detailed versus way more detailed. Which is an interesting point. Um, I'm not entirely- I, I definitely get where you're coming from there. There was a couple things I was like, mm, a little bit different. Like, for instance, we saw the bathhouse in, Taki for, in, the, in the sanatorium with Takako much sooner than we saw any type of bathhouse with uh, Sachiko. And I remember she didn't even visit a bathhouse in the inn, she went to the one that was up in the mountains. Um, but I mean, you still have a good point where like it did feel like we kind of explored the mansion and the sanatorium roughly the same pace, so I think it's uh, you've got some valid arguments there for sure. Uh, anyway though, fantastic detail. Um, the fact that we're pointing this stuff out is telling me that like we are starting to kind of find this resolution somewhere along the line. Um, I hope so. Sajiko seems to be doing a lot better. She's going on a hike right now. Now, the thing I pointed out last episode that I thought was interesting is I felt like in Sajiko's timeline, it seemed like she was like at the beginning of winter. This is a time where there's not a lot of people up at the inn. Um, there was snow in the last episode, like the episode before we switched to Narasaki's perspective while she was exploring the Mind Palace. Um... But now we're like hiking and it looks very green. And I've learned that there's nothing, mis there's no mistakes with the background, so. Um, oh, I just realized though, a good thing to point out. Like, I've talked about how like all of these Visachiko, like they seem like pictures that are blurred. But then when we switched to Takako, it was all kind of like, it looked like there was a like, computer generated stuff. Is that part of it too? Like, is this like, is this reality because it looks like it's based off of like a real picture? And then, ooh, interesting. I wonder if that, I, I'm guessing that was intentional too, but I'm not sure how consistent that was because I haven't been watching for it. Not specifically. Anyway, let's continue reading and see where Sachiko goes on her hike. Uh, especially because Takako apparently is considering trying to find Sachiko, which could be for the last time, you know, but we'll see. <clears throat> the map's recommended route was not the same road I used to come here. Instead, it led around the mountain, emerging near the back of the library. Once again, last time I talked about how like I like to go hiking, uh, and went hiking a lot when I was younger, like uh, high school age, and uh, that was the way we hiked on this really cool uh, trek called Table Rock, which is really fun. It's out in Wyoming. If you ever look it up, it's a really beautiful hike. Um, there's two roads on the hike. There's the face, which is very much more vertical, but it's faster. Or there's Huckleberry Canyon, which will take you on like, like it's like if you go up the face, I think it's like a five mile hike. If you go Huckleberry Canyon, it's more like like eight to 10 miles, I think. I'm not entirely sure of that length. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, but yeah, like the, the Huckleberry uh, Canyon was a lot more, it's a lot prettier and it's a lot more ups and downs rather than just constantly up. Uh, but yeah, like, t like the, the traditional way to hike it was to go up the face and then down the canyon um, because like you wanted to tackle the hard part early on while you had a lot of energy and going down the steeper slopes is, is a lot more like I don't know it's funny because like when you go hiking 
you quickly learn that going down is sometimes harder than going up. Like, you, like it may sound counterintuitive, and truly it's easier to go down, but stopping yourself from tumbling down a slope is actually harder when you get to a certain gradient. <laughs> and um, you spend all your time, like, trying to, like, your feet smashed into the front of your shoes, trying to, like, keep yourself from falling. So, anyway, uh, not surprised that she's taking an alternate route. I can feel the cool breeze on my skin. I descend on the gentle slope, fighting against gravity's attempts to hasten my step. I cross the river, careful of the moss-covered, slippery-looking stones. <clears throat> After a few more minutes on the path, I emerge onto a wide road. I pause there for a moment. As I took out the map from my bag and confirmed the direction I should continue in, I spotted a girl walking toward me at one end of the road. It was Kozua. Hello? Hello. Are you going to the library? I asked. Kozua nodded and asked if I was planning to go somewhere. I answered that I was actually on my way back. She gave me an uh, apprehensive look. What, did she not want to walk with us? As I was trying to understand what it meant, she passed by me. I put the map back in my bag and followed her. <clears throat> Do you know a lake that should be around here? It's that way. Kozo pointed into the woods. Looking in the direction she pointed in, I couldn't see anything other than the trees. There's a road further down. I'll show you. I have worried she was going to be like mad I'm trying to get us lost or something. Ooh, very pretty. I followed the path that Kozo showed me. After only a few dozen meters, I could make out a body of water through the tree branches. The lake stretched much wider than I thought, its surface still a mirror, still as a mirror. I sat down on the half-withered tree I found lying on a small sandy beach. It turned out to be sturdier than it looked. It didn't seem like I had to worry about it crashing under my weight. Well, she's a twig, of course not. I shifted my gaze back to the lake, observing the black hummus-covered slope. Um, is that, is that right? Hummus? Like, is that a common plant in Japan? Interesting. Hummus covered slope come in contact with the water, as well as another fallen tree with its roots sticking out next, next to it. It didn't seem like the lake had retrieved or received any artificial treatment. The area that I was sitting in was the closest I could get to the water without risking of falling in. The water was so clear I could see the sand at the lake's bottom. Ooh, I love clear water. At some areas, it seemed like the surrounding vegetation had also invaded the lake itself, covering parts of its bottom in green. Watching the lake reminded me that one time Takako invited me to go fishing. We were still in middle school. Takako, me, and two of her good friends at the time left our houses on our bicycles. Our destination was the lake that Takako's family used to visit by car all the time. She was the only one who knew the location. <laughs> uh, I'm foreseeing a problem. <laughs> Takako said it only took 20 minutes by car. Oh my gosh. But being two um, but being two mountains and one river away, the place wasn't exactly easy to reach for a bunch of children. In truth, Takako's two friends gave up after seeing the slopes leading over the first mountain. I would have left myself, but I knew Takako would not give up and try and press on with or without us. I would have been it would have been bad if she got lost, so I followed her while making sure to remember the way. Memorizing the unusual roofs of the houses in the mountains, I was thinking that I'd have Takako turn back around noon, even if by force. However, by noon, we'd already reached the lake. Ooh, nice. Although, that could make returning troublesome. Takako was overjoyed by having reached the place from her memories. That really must have taken forever. That told me how little the way she actually remembered. <laughs> I looked at the lake currently in front of my eyes. The lake we found with Takako didn't have a wooden pier with a proper, or a proper path leading to it. It was as wild as the forest around it. It also had a big tree leaning right over the water. Ooh. I mentioned before, I grew up uh, with a grandfather who lived on a lake in Montana. And uh, there were a few spots. There was a particular spot where there were trees that would hang over the water. And some brave soul, like, and I'm talking like really tall pines. Someone climbed up, tied this really big sturdy rope to a branch like must have been decades ago and those who are brave which included all of us i promise i did it at least once i'm pretty sure i pr yeah I, I think i remember it um you could go onto the bank you could grab it and you pull it up and it had like a little like sheer kind of cliff edge like right over the water and you'd grab it and you'd swing out and jump off and splash in the lake it was pretty cool taku had a bright had the bright idea to do her fishing from atop that very tree Meanwhile, I lay down on a sheet in the sandy beach in front, in, by the lake, just like this one, and ate a jam sandwich while observing her. It was it was a pleasant, silent place. 
We spent about two hours at that lake. I read a book I'd brought while Takako tempted the fish. Big fish would sometimes jump up at the water, causing ripples to spread along the lake's surface. Though we didn't catch anything in the end, Takako was satisfied by the experience. I couldn't remember the way back at all by th that well, but by the time we got back it was already dark outside. Needless to say, my parents were furious. I freaking bet. When we left the lake, Takako suggested we come back another day. I did give her a half-hearted reply of sorts, but I wasn't really planning on ever coming back. As such, that was the first and last time we went to that lake. I felt a bit sad, so I took a deep breath and slowly exhaled. That was about another little episode from my past. The chilly air filled my lungs, soothing my aching heart. Now that I thought about it, that might have been the furthest trip I'd ever taken on a bicycle. And I'd forgotten all about it until now. I tried remembering my childhood. Fishing, hot springs, amusement parks, zoos, aquariums. Takako forced me to accompany her to a whole variety of places. As I remembered the lake from my past, it felt like it began overlapping with the one I was staring at now. Before I knew it, I couldn't tell which detail was supposed to belong to which scenery. Yeah, her brain's a little fluid night right now. I quickly snapped out of that state, realizing I'd been breathing heavily. Probably wouldn't have been wise to stay away from those. It probably would have been wise to stay away from those memories until I calmed down. But they started swirling around me like a ship had lost its rudder. I soon gave up on resting and instead decided to take an objective look at them. First, I asked myself whether this lake was part of the real world. All lakes look the same anyway. I answered myself. That was probably more or less true. When you start thinking about it too much, the resemblance becomes all the more striking. Or perhaps my memories are actually being overwritten by the scenery. Actually, probably true. You've never been here before. In any case, this wasn't that lake. I had no way of returning to the past. That was a healthy attitude. Interesting. She's very well present now. Very, very much more present. <sighs> oh, hello, Lily. Oh, welcome back. I ran to Lily in the lobby. Hello. I hear you were out hiking. How far did you go? I followed the route on your map by uh, Sakura, Sakura Dai, Dai, Sakura Dai. Oh, Sakura Dai. The scenery is quite striking there, especially during good weather. It was nice, wasn't it? Yeah, I could see beyond the gulf into the observation platform. I had lunch there, then circled around the mountain to come back. I see. Nana has only just returned too. I think she's preparing dinner right now. I see. Oh, whoa. Oh, that's right. I brought Kozo to the, arch uh, to the architectural office the other day. Everyone really liked her. At first, she was quite a mouse, quiet as a mouse. But once we began talking about the mansion, she suddenly started asking more and more questions until even the guys at the office started to run out of answers. In the end, they told us to come visit again anytime. That's kind of cool. I'm glad to hear that. Kozuo said she was worried about bothering everyone with her curiosity. Hmm. I see. I'm the one who invited her, so there really was no need for her to worry. To think that she's already considering these things at her age. My, what a nice girl. She might come off as a bit shy at first, but once you talk to her, you realize she can be surprisingly assertive. And she's cute as a button to boot. I wish Nana was more like her when she was a child. I imagine Nana was quite active in her younger years. <laughs> Indeed she was. At Kozo's age, she was still running around the mountain looking for insects. Yes, she didn't seem like the kind of girl who'd be afraid of bugs. I imagine Nanae chasing after insects and fishing in the mountains, which in turn made me remember Takako. Hmm. Oh, will you look at the time, said Lily as she glanced at the clock. To tell the truth, I still haven't finished some of my duties. We can discuss Nanae's childhood some other time. Okay. See you later, then. See you. After that, I climbed the stairs and returned to my room. I undressed, took a shower, and changed into something more comfortable. I glanced out the window while drying my hair at the dresser and saw the evening sun beginning to gradually shower the mountain range with its crimson rays. After lightly combing my hair, I descended to the lobby. The grandfather clock had just struck five o'clock. I considered going to the kitchen to look for Nanae, but then realized I would probably be getting in the way of her cooking, so I changed my mind. I shifted my eyes to the corner of the lobby, remembering the reading area Nanae and I designed together. 
Now that I looked at it, I got worried whether the chair would really fit there. Curious about the overall design of the room, I sat down on one of the stools by the wall and began to slowly scrutinize my surroundings. I could hear the grandfather clock creak with each new uh, swing of the pendulum. That little thing must have been a pain to maintain. A jug with a forest plant. Fo uh, a jug with a forest plant in it rested on the counter. A black bone slumbered all alone on a stool in the corner. I felt like Nana had nothing to worry about concerning the lobby coming off as dull. By the time the orange rays of the sun penetrated the stained glass on the door, I started to regret not bringing a book with me. Being left with no other option, I spent some time observing the patches of sunlight as they slowly traveled from the center of the lobby to the uh, camellia. Camellia. I don't know how to say that word properly. I'm, I'm guessing I'm getting it wrong. Then to the old register on the counter. I suddenly remembered how I met Nana in Rome. She said she was looking for new furniture. Even this room alone had an expensive looking glass shelf on the other end of the counter, an old decorative typewriter, some seemingly an and seemingly antique stools, not to mention all the other things I'd already mentioned. I wonder how much of those Nana collected by herself. Uh, the closer I looked, I realized the items all seemed to date back to a wide variety of periods and came from all sorts of regions. Oh, there she is. However, they were all part of the world that Nana created. A place filled with a soothing, nostalgic atmosphere that reminds me of the western fairy tales I used to read as a child. I figured I should ask her about what buying standards were. What her buying standards were. The curious ringing sound shook me away from my daydream. It appeared to be the phone. I continued to ring as I gazed at it. It didn't seem like Lily or anyone was coming to pick it up. I stood up and walked in front of the phone. I picked up the receiver. Hello? And Arasaki switch! Scene change. Hello? The, um, hello! The voice from the other end of the line sounded kind of nostalgic. I instantly res recognized it as Narasaki's. I'm sorry. I made, I made you promise to call, but I ended up forgetting about it. Oh, sorry. Oh, don't worry about it. I wasn't sure if I'd have time to call anyway. Did you manage to get back all right? Yep, she said. One of her usual snorts followed. Suddenly I heard the song of a grandfather clock. Is something wrong? Narasaki asked as the sound startled me. No, the clock just surprised me, that's all. Hearing me say that, Narasaki let out another chuckle. <laughs> the clock continued to gong. I felt like I could hear it from the other end of the line, too. Did you like the flowers, Sachiko? Flowers? Yep, flowers. Well, I suppose I do. Not much more than the average person, though. In that case, maybe you should try growing a garden as a hobby. Why? That sounds pretty random, coming from you. Taking care of living things does wonders for relaxation. I wonder if she's drawing the connection more, like, more with, a. Uh... Oh, shoot. Nanae? Like, Nanae? Like, the nurse? I wonder if she's... Maybe she's seeing that as, like, Sachiko's subconscious version of herself. I'd recommend keeping a pet, but you're allergic to fur, if I remember correctly. Hmm. I just thought it'd fit you. Really? Well, I'll think about it. Um, how is your schedule looking? When do you think I should drop by your clinic again? Not as like I didn't say anything, so I brought up the subject myself. However, she didn't answer right away, instead of making a long pause. I don't think we'll be able to meet for a while. Why? I got a sudden new job. I'll have to travel a bit far for it for a while. What do you mean far? Where are you going? What's going to happen to your clinic? The location isn't clear yet. As for the clinic, I'll be closing it. That's sudden. Sorry, but I'll be busy for a while, that's like I said after I fell silent. She explained that we would not be meeting for a long while. I was even planning to buy her a present on my way back, but now I felt a little dejected by the sudden turn of events. Hey, these things happen, you know, Narasaki added as I absentmindedly coiled the phone's cord around my finger. If I started, but gave up. It's going to be lonely without you, I said instead. You can always call Nana or Lily if you need company. I suppose so. Calling Nana from time to time did sound like a pretty good idea. But I also felt like Narasaki's departure would leave a gaping hole in my life. 
if you start to feel lonely, just blame it on the season. It's all too easy to get caught up in the melancholy mood when it's cold and silent outside. Your apartment has a balcony, right? Try growing prim primroses. They're strikingly colorful things that actually bloom in the winter. I'll give that a try, if I feel like it. Good. Well then, I'll be hanging up. There's still something I need to take care of. Oh, that's what she's saying. Well, I'll be I'll be hanging up. There's still something I need to take care of. I see. What's wrong? Is there something you want to tell me? I was already prepared to hear her say goodbye, but she didn't end the conversation just yet. What makes you think that? I pulled my finger away from the cord, letting it stretch back at its normal length. Whenever you left your grandparents' house in the country, you'd always keep waving at them from the rear window of the car until they were completely out of sight. That's the kind of child you were. I'm not a child anymore. You really think so? Narasaki said. I'm hanging up. Okay. See you. See you. I pulled the receiver away from my ear and placed it on the phone. I heaved a deep breath as I let go let go of it and stole a glance around the clock. At the clock. Its minute arrow was pointing at the number two. That was a very that was a very long conversation. The piece of the stained glass on the door glowed a navy blue. As I considered going back to my room to wait for dinner, I suddenly felt a kind of tired and didn't want to climb the staircase. I sat down on the same stool as before and waited for my sudden exhaustion to pass. I glanced at the phone, but remembering Narasaki's last words, I quickly looked away. Placing my elbows on my knees, I rested my forehead on my palms. I closed my eyes, listening to the pendulum swing back and forth. Hmm, sad. I opened my eyes to see an already familiar canopy above the bed. Wait, wait, where did she get to the bedroom? I promptly sat up and slid out from under the sheets as I always did. Then I got changed and headed off to have breakfast. Wait, what? As I reached the cafeteria, I found Nanae with my breakfast at the usual table. I greeted her and we began eating together. The meal consisted of bread rolls, scrambled eggs, spaghetti, spinach, salad, sausages, and a handful of cherry tomatoes. Dang! Breakfast of freaking champions! This looks even more extravagant than usual. It's your last breakfast here, so I felt like putting a bit of extra effort. She looks... different now. Is that a kimono? <laughs> That's a kimono! <laughs> you can leave some time- you can leave some of us too much. I rolled the bread, uh, a soft ham, and a crispy cheese inside. After finishing the bread, I scooped up a mouthful of spaghetti with my fork. This is pretty nostalgic. I remember having something similar back in school, but it wasn't this good. Hm. Right? I like them so much I ended up looking up the recipe. Those noodles are kind of unusual. Do they even sell those in the supermarket? They're called soft noodles. You can get them directly from manufacturers if you order a large amount. I see. Interesting. Apparently, they're specially made for school lunches. They don't get as mushy as the normal ones and are supposed to be better for digestion. Yeah. I remember how easily they tear just from a gentle touch of your chopsticks. Exactly! Now that I nodded. I really- I- um... I realized this after looking it up, but apparently, Japanese school lunches are, after the war, mostly used bread imported from America. The noodle industry eventually caught wind of it and decided to increase the variety of food available at schools, developing these noodles as a result. They're especially rich in vitamin B1 and B2 vitamins that children desperately needed back in those days. Wow. Info dump, but cool. It all started in Tokyo before gradually spreading all across the country. I would never have guessed that, these spaghetti had, had, <laughs> that this spaghetti had such a rich history. We spent the rest of our lunch discussing the kinds of food we eat at school. Apparently, Nana was a big fan of mackerel miso soup. When I mentioned I liked to make sushi rolls, she taught me a few tricks to make the process easier and the result neater. That sounds fun. I haven't made sushi rolls in a while. I spent the afternoon in the mansion like I always did. After packing my bags, I made it down to the lobby. Nana promised she'd meet me with by her car, but I arrived a bit earlier than the agreed upon time. I placed my bags under the counter and light lingered in the lobby for a while. I was thinking about sitting down on the stool when a black phone entered my vision. It didn't seem like it would be ringing again anytime soon. 
I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't even plugged in. Is something wrong? Did my phone offend you in some way? Now that I appeared in the doorway behind the counter. Checking the clock, I realized it was about time for my departure. No, it's nothing. I see. Well, let's be on our way, I guess. Right. Man, feels weird. They didn't say more. Say, like, official goodbye. Make promises or say you don't want to see each other, I guess. I don't know. How did you like it here? Nane asked as we rattled down the same road. I said it on my first day here. I had a great time. It's been so long since I felt so relaxed. I'm almost looking forward to going back to work the day after tomorrow. Glad to hear it. The car rattled as they passed over a big hole in the road, making Nane grow silent. I caught a glimpse of the sea beyond the trees around us. Feel free to drop by for another visit if you're ever in the mood. Oh, definitely. Man, if weird we're leaving, like, I, I feel a little sense of sad. Now that I told me she had some unfinished work to attend to when we parted ways at the station. After waiting a minute or so for me to go inside, she drove away. I found a small shop inside the station. <sighs> I wonder what kind of shop this is. I briefly inspected its lineup. It had some snacks, newspapers, a souvenir corner. Key holders, wood carvings, the glass sculptures lined the long shelf. I found a familiar writing utensil among the lineup, clips with cute bears on them. I felt like I had too few to put them in any real use, so I considered buying a bit more here. But as I wondered if it was really necessary, I grew worried about the time. I checked the clock inside the station and realized it was about time for my train. In the end, I bought two packs of clippings, thinking I might as well give the extra ones to my workmates as a present. Then I bought a few more things I thought they might like. I bought the ticket to the, uh, uh, at the booth that I told me about, and as soon as I stepped onto the platform, the train arrived. Perfect. And what, is that it? We're just gone? Like, no more Nana? Ooh, hello. The train car rocked back and forth. I let out a sigh and inhaled a breath, realizing that the air in here smelled a lot like the way it does back home in the countryside. A complete mix of stills, steel, trees, and sea, old buildings, and incense. The scents, war uh, wa uh, the scents waned as each station we passed. Instead, the towns began to grow bigger and bigger. After the next station, we emerged next to the highway along the sea. I watched the sun set along the sea, illuminating the train cars in its orange glow. It sank deeper and deeper into the western horizon. I closed my eyes, turning my face to the center of the light. I imagined a world where the sun rose from the west. Hmm. Takako was sleeping there, on the other side. The faint sun rays would soon fall on her closed eyelids, gently waking her. She would then do her usual routine of radio exercises and head to work. That silly train of thought was enough to make me feel like this would, I, I would be okay. Mm -hmm. Opening my eyes, I saw the entire train painted in orange. It felt almost like I was in a pleasant warm bath. I truly managed to put my vacation time to good use this time. Hallucinations and ear ringing that had been plaguing me for quite a while seemed to have completely disappeared over the past few days. I felt like I could return to work in top shape, but I also wasn't planning to talk, take on as much as I, I used to near the end of the year. Hmm. So in a way, she's still, like, the sanatorium's still a part of her. She can actually see it in a bit. Kind of reminds me... This is going to sound really weird. Um, I read Lord of the Rings when I was really young. It was a challenge my dad set me when I was in sixth grade. Because I saw the movie trailer and I was really excited about the movie because it looked awesome. And my dad made me the deal. He said if I read the Lord of the Rings um, books before the movies came out, he would take me to them when they came out in theaters. Um, and I really wanted him to make him do that, so I read the books. <laughs> and uh, both in books and movie forms. I kind of was happy to get to the end, but like, there's that scene where uh, Frodo, Bilbo, and Gandalf uh, take the boats uh, into the the far into far the far harbor. I think it's that like it's like kind of like 
almost like a heaven, like it's like a, a, a place of eternity where the elves go. Um, and just that scene, which is so funny because it's such a weird little scene. But it had such a bitterness to it. I'm kind of feeling the same thing right now. There's nothing happening here. It's just describing a sunset and an idea of a world where the sun rose in the west. But like, I just can't help but think about that ending of the book and that kind of somber feeling that came with it. I shoved my right hand into the pockets of my jacket and, continue, and, and com to confirm my ticket when my tickets touched something cold and hard inside. I took it out and realized it was the penguin toy Kozua gave me as a present. It shone dully in the orange light, its silly face looking somewhat sad. I felt a tear roll down my cheek. Wondering if a stray sun ray reflected on something nearby surface that hurt my eye, I slightly rubbed it. When I did, another tear spilled forth from it. God, don't do this to me, game! How are you doing this to me? It's like witchcraft! It makes me feeling- and feeling emotions and there's no reason for it! I paused for a moment, unable to understand what was causing this. No other tears followed, with the second one remaining moist on my cheek. The exact same scenery I'd observed on my way here drifted past the other way on the, uh, along the other end of the window. I felt like I myself was now somehow different. Something didn't add up. I was like I left behind something in that mansion. I could recall someone telling me I had nothing to worry about anymore, but I couldn't remember who it was or when it happened. Oh man. And I had a feeling I'd never be able to. I touched the trail left by the teardrop on my cheek. Feeling pain in my heart every time the train car swayed. It was like something important was being peeled away from it, little by little. However, I had no way of escaping the moving train. All I could do was sit here, waiting for it to reach its final destination. I felt like I heard a faint voice in the corner of my mind, but I couldn't make it out. A deep darkness enveloped everything. <laughs> No, that's it. She is gone now, isn't she? Watch, we'll do a scene change and jump right back to her, aren't we? Ugh, gosh darn it. It's new beginnings, huh? Chapter 10, Distant Sound. Is, uh, is, uh, Takako gonna be able to say goodbye to her? We'll see. Oh. Come on, I can do this. We can do a little more. I returned to the night duty room after my conversation with Narasaki, picked up our teacups and the pot from the table and carried them to the kitchen. I spilled what little tea was left on the bottom of the pot into the sink and I realized I was out of boiled water to make more. I pulled a kettle off one of the shelves, filled it with water and put it on the stove. I mulled over my conversation with Narasaki while waiting for the water to boil. The conversation hardly took an hour, but I'd learned a lot. My head was still spinning, having received all the information about the diaries and illness and whatnot. Now that I thought about it, I should have used the chance to ask Narasaki more questions. For example, she said she had met me before in the past. I forgot to even ask when that happened. Besides, while Narasaki seemed amiable to answer more or less everything I asked, I felt like there was still something off about how she phrased certain things. I wondered if she really didn't know how Sachiko liked the like, like she tried to imply. She didn't seem at all surprised or even curious when I told her Sachiko was the most important person of my life, almost as though she knew about our relationship. The hiss of the kettle brought brought me back to reality. I poured the boiling water into the pot filled with old tea leaves. I filled my teacup with freshly made tea and took a sip, feeling my head clear up. I grabbed one of the uh, monaka, uh, monaka that Narasaki brought me and returned to the living room, sitting down on the cushion by the table. A bunch of keys Narasaki had me lay in the middle of the table. They were all connected by a silver ring. Some of the keys had small green hexagonal key holders attached to them. Being all the same, they reminded me of the keys used in hotels. They were different from the key holders Mayoko used. I picked one of I picked one key holder to realize it was a bit heavier than I thought. It sparkled slightly, reflecting the lights as I turned it in my palm. I suddenly spotted a number on it. Upon turning it a bit more to the light, I could make out the room number. I tried checking which room keys I had, and eventually found one in the Kozuo's old room. The portal. The, the way back. I placed the keys back on the table. 
I remembered how I saw Sachiko in that room. I tried to get back to that room multiple times, but it was always locked. I didn't realize it until now, but the tea I drank seemed more bitter than usual. I now had the chance to check that room before returning the keys to Miyoko. For some reason, I felt like it wasn't a complete coincidence they ended up in my possession. I tried coming up with an explanation, but ultimately failed. I wondered whether I should go to that room right now, or instead tell Narasaki about what I experienced there. However, I couldn't figure out exactly what I was supposed to ask her. I was the only one who knew what happened here, there. Narasaki might have understood something I didn't, had I told her everything. On the other hand, she might have just deemed me crazy and looked, looked, locked me up or something. Besides, based on our previous conversation, it was already evident that she was trying to avoid discussing Sachiko with me. There was no guarantee she'd tell me anything, even if she knew. I gulped down the remainder of my drink and picked up the keys. I removed the one with Kozawa's old room number on it, and then shoved it into my pocket. It was entirely possible that nothing would happen, even if I, if I were there, went there. However, I couldn't help but feel like there was something important in that room. I made sure to slide the flashlight to my back pocket before leaving the night duty room. Oh man, Takiko, what are you gonna do? I ran to Sanae at the spiral staircase in the lobby. I was looking for you, said Sanae as she approached me. She told me she was just on her way to the night duty room after finding my room empty. What's up? I'm not working today. You told me you wanted to recommend you some books. I glanced at the cover of the book she was holding. I had an illustration depicting a sci-fi cityscape with a semi-futuristic look. I remember seeing Sanae read that book before. I saw you reading that. It's a mystery novel with lots of action elements. I thought you'd enjoy it. The mystery itself is pretty good too. She, uh, the mystery itself is pretty good too. She added. That sounds fun, but I'm a bit busy right now. I'll swing by your room and pick it up later, okay? Fine by me. Sunday so nodded and returned to her room. I continued down the corridor to the opposite direction, slowly slowing my steps so Sanae wouldn't see me st stop in front of the locked room. I waited for her to turn a corner. I took a glance over my shoulder. Sanae was nowhere to be seen. I quickly surveyed the rest of my surroundings, making absolutely sure there wasn't anyone on the opposite end of the corridor either. I then took out the key in my pocket and stuck it into the lock. On second thought, I didn't necessarily have to hide this from Sanae. She wouldn't tell Mayako about it if I asked her to keep a secret. Besides, all she would have likely done was warn me to be careful. I doubt if she would have tried to stop me. Still, I didn't want to force her to lie for me, so perhaps this was for the best. I turned the key of the click, and the lock opened. The handle no longer resisted me. I considered what I would do if I ended up being unable to return. I remember promising Mayako to tell her before going somewhere. But that was already after I'd entered the room and closed the door behind me. Oh my gosh, what is gonna happen? There is nothing but a bed and an empty shelf in the room, just like the day I went looking for the thing Kosovo lost. The place even felt kind of nostalgic. Now that I thought about it, I never even learned what I was looking for in here. The evening light flickered in through the window, preventing the room from being as dark as last time. I wondered if I should have opened the window, but since I didn't come here to clean or do anything of the sort, I figured I'd leave it alone for now. I walked to the center of the room and spun around. The place looked like a normal room. There were no caves or any other trippy imagery we don't the last, I witnessed last time. When I leaned against the shelf, my hand ended up covered in dust. I pulled my hand back, realizing I'd left a handprint. It didn't seem like it had been emptied that long. I considered sleeping on the bed, but that probably was a bad idea. After placing my hand back in the same spot, I closed my eyes. And with that, I remembered everything that happened here last time. A tiny sliver of light surrounded by a boundless darkness. When I moved closer to it, I saw Sachiko's back. She was sitting on a stone, facing away from me. When I tried speaking to her, she noticed my voice and slightly turned around. And that was where it ended. I replayed it in my mind countless times, so I was absolutely certain. It got really quiet. When I opened my eyes, the room had been swallowed by darkness. Surprised, I took a step back, hitting the shelf behind me with, the butt with my buttocks. The flashlight I brought with me slid out of my pocket and fell to the ground. Well, that's useful! I instantly turned around and picked it up, but I couldn't see anything in the blinding dark. The sudden turn of events left me a little dizzy. 
Realizing I wouldn't be able to rely on my eyes anymore, I tried discerning my surroundings using my other senses. The scents and sounds I detected told me I was back in that place. I tried grasping around for the flashlight, but had no idea where it fell anymore. I could no longer even find the shelf I'd hit earlier. In fact, I didn't even hear the sound of the flashlight hitting the floor. Perhaps I'd left it on the other side. Surrounded by the hollow darkness, I let out a sigh. I swiftly to calm myself, focusing instead on what I was to do next. I came here to find Sachiko. I wanted to know whether the present Sachiko, whom I couldn't completely I couldn't completely remember, was doing and where she was. I slowly took another look around. This definitely wasn't the best of situations, but for some reason I didn't panic. Oddly enough, this darkness felt more nostalgic than intimidating. The last time I was here, I was too surprised to be able to think straight. But now, I felt like my head was working even better than usual. Perhaps the thought I might find Sachiko here made it that way. Whenever I was by her side, I felt neither fear nor anxiety. I heard a gust of wind blow past me. It reminded me of the sound of fast-moving subway trains. Additionally, the cool and musty smell reminded me of the floor of my old apartment. When I was little, I used to dig down into the sandbox to find the driest and smoothest sand to use as topping for my sand pancakes. A few times, I managed to find sand that had turned a light green. I still had no idea what that was supposed to be. In any case, I stored my greenish pancake in an empty water tank I found at the warehouse. It was always dry and cold inside, so it was perfect for storage. A few times I left my pancakes under the stairs in my apartment, I found them cracked, looking as though a cat or dog had stepped in them. Those I stored in the tank, they probably survived until I moved. For some reason, I couldn't remember that clearly. I only remember how I stored them in the tank. Hmm. I checked to see if any of my limbs were still numb, and decided to move forward. Much like last time, the ground on my feet was hard, rocky texture to it. Careful not to trip, I slowly continued forward. The distorted echoes of my footsteps reverberated across the darkness. I continued walking for a while, but hit no walls or any other barriers. This was definitely not the insi not inside that room anymore. I was back. I blinked, but it didn't help. With or without my eyes closed, everything would still remain the same. Perhaps this whole thing was just in my head. My eyes had nothing to do with it. Or you're in someone else's head. There was something off with my footsteps, so I paused for a bit. My last footstep reverberated across the area. Sound grew, sound grew gradually until it, it quiet, uh, gradually quieter until it eventually disappeared. But the sound of my next footstep reached free from behind. I turned around, but I still couldn't see anything. Nonetheless, I could hear rhythmic footsteps approaching me from that very direction. I rubbed my eyes and felt like I spotted a white stain of sorts in the darkness. I focused my eyes on it and then rubbed them again. The white stain began to grow bigger and bigger with each footstep I heard. It was a white shadow. Stretching tall from the ground, it had the shape of a person. It was coming toward me. Who is it? I stood in place for a few moments until the shadow came close enough for me to reach it. I stopped right in, fr it stopped right in front of me. Yet, I still couldn't figure out what it was supposed to be. It had a blurry contours and no colors. It really was just a white shadow. Sachiko's shadow. As it swayed from left to right, I could have sworn it was crying. Suddenly, it reached out and covered my eyes. What's happening? Uh huh. The bedroom. After blinking a few times, I looked around. I was back in a room. Before I knew it, I stood there in the middle, staring at the door. For a moment, I thought I was back, but this wasn't the same room I came from. I looked around while rubbing my arms. It was incredibly cold. I wore a coat over a long sleeve shirt, a choice of apparel that would keep me warm during winter, yet the air in this room felt like it could penetrate right through this layer, chilling my skin. The room was about the same size as Kozo was, but the interior was different. The bed actually had a canopy with a curtain. The curtain was closed, making it impossible to see inside. I took a few steps to see if causing any sounds would just would change anything. The dry sound of my footsteps reverberated across the room, but that was about it. I couldn't feel anyone's presence. It was still as death. Only a faint reddish light illuminated the interior. I stuck my hands in the gap between the curtains and slowly pulled them away. There was no one in the bed, much like I expected. The curtains completely surrounded the entire bed, blocking view of its sides. I could barely make out the lamp at the silhouette of the clock on the one side. 
I had to circle around the bed to check the either side, either of its sides. I inspected the room's interior one more time as I walked around. There was a uh, Dracania plant in the pot by the door. An oil painting some landscape hung on the wall to the right of it. Underneath it rested, rested an antique looking dresser. It was well organized and neatly maintained. Feeling like I'd seen some of these things before, I returned my gaze to the painting. It was either the scenery or the painting itself, but I could remember neither of, neither what it was of nor the painter who could have painted the thing. I walked closer to have a better look, but that didn't help. Perhaps I never really knew this thing to begin with. As my hand touched the dresser, I instinctively pulled it back. But then I realized I had no reason to be afraid and leaned against the desk. It didn't have a single speck of dust on it. Whoever used it must have been a clean freak. The dresser had acute bent legs. I spotted an odd dent in one of them, with a bit of wood chipper where a bit of wood chipped away. It was around the height you'd stub your toe at. Just looking at it made my toe ache. Ooh. Stubbing your toe hard enough to chip wood? That sounds horrible. Relaxed by such a silly thought, I turned around and stopped again. I wonder how I knew the shape of the other side of the bed was a clock. Its silhouette was so blurred I couldn't have possibly figured out what it was based on just that. Yet I still knew it was a clock. It was a rectangular shaped thing with a little roof on top. It had a round clock border on the top with the pendulum swinging underneath it. A little dwarf used to come out and play the melody whenever the clock struck the hour, but one of its springs had gone bad and now no longer worked. I listened to the swinging pendulum while gazing at the vague contours of the clock. I followed it to the other side of the bed. The sound that I thought was just my imagination turn, turned more and more real with each step. A side table stood by the bed. The clock I just described rested on it. Hmm. I felt my head grow hot when I confirmed it really was the same thing. Okay, what the? It wasn't just a clock that I was familiar with. I knew the side table, I knew the lamp, I knew the dresser, I knew the painting. This was the bedroom of the apartment I shared with Sachiko. It was as though memories frozen in the back of my mind began to melt. The pendulum sound went through them like an ice pick. The curtains around the bed moved, a slight gap opening between them. White steam rose from it. As I looked at that, I realized my fingers had grown cold. The room's temperature had fallen so low that my breath was starting to turn white. I stuck my frozen hands in the gap between the curtains and slowly pulled them to myself. Someone was now on the previously empty bed. It lay on its sheets in a beautiful posture. It had the same face as me, but its skin was pale as snow. Oh no. I don't know what this memory is probably going to be. Oh no. Thinking? I felt like I heard someone's voice. The lifeless lips of me lying on the bed remained closed. I strained my ears and indeed heard something again. It sounded akin to someone talking to themselves. The voice I heard in between the rhythmic sound of the pendulum was likely the same one I'd listened to the most during my life. I'm sure of its source, I continued looking at myself on the bed for a while. A faint voice definitely originated in this room. I focused all my attention on it, careful not to disturb with any stray thoughts, almost like an archaeologist digging out a brittle antique. Eventually, I started to make out the words of that familiar voice. Oh no. My surroundings suddenly grew dark. It wasn't because someone turned off the lights. I simply closed my eyes without being consciously aware of it. I finally realized the voice was coming from inside my head. Oh... The nice scenery was really beautiful, wasn't it? Which scenery? The one we saw at the Golden Gate. I mean, we ended up going there because you wanted to see the location of your favorite movie. We rented a car for two days, you drove us up the opposite shore. Don't you remember? I heard lots of suicides happen on that bridge. What a nice thing to remember. I remember it, but I want to hear how you remember it. Okay. Sachiko began telling me about our trip. Okay, I flipped them a lot, I think. Sachiko began telling me about our trip. Which... Oh, maybe she was losing her memory. Which tourist spots did we, vis uh, we visit after the airport? How we spent time at the hotel? 
Sachiko told me everything, right down to the smallest detail. Listening to her speak, I started feeling like going on another trip together. I want to go there again. Where? Wherever. You can decide this time. Yeah. Okay. I'll think about it. I felt the warmth of Sachiko's right hand in my left. Her slender fingers, with its beautiful nails intertwined with mine. Have you decided yet? I asked. I'd like to go on a cruise. I want something where I wouldn't need to move a lot and could take my time reading books. She, but, uh, I want something where I wouldn't need to move a lot and could take my time reading books, she added. Well, I'd prefer something with a bit more physical exercise, personally. We can do that after you get better. Hey, I'm fine. I think I've been getting a lot better lately. Sachiko's features clouded over. You really think so? I'd better ask the doctor then. Sachiko pulled up the doll from the drawer and showed it to me. Narasaki. I can't handle this right now. I can't handle this right now. I'm not gonna make it, guys. It wore a white lab coat. <laughs> Sachiko raised one of the doll's hands and said, Hey there. Hey there. It's been a while. I remember it now. You played with this back in the kindergarten, right? You must have seen it at least a hundred times in my room. I found it the other day when I was looking for our graduation album. That's nostalgic. Tell me about it. Tell me about it, the doll said, raising its hands. Hey, if you're a doctor, could you do a checkup on me? Let's see, the doll's little hand pressed against my forehead. Speaking of which, where did your speaking of which, where did your stethoscope go? I lost it somewhere. Well, not like I can de can't determine your condition just by looking at you. That's quite the skill to have. You have a fever. Does your head hurt? Just a little. Seems you need more rest. You should sleep for tonight. You think you can manage that? I'm not feeling that bad. I can sleep just fine. I'll be here by your side, so close your eyes and relax. Sorry, I said that backwards, but I mean, that's good to hear. I returned to the darkness as the voices in my memory drew further away. I kept my eyes closed, waiting for the next voice. I didn't hear anything for a while, but I couldn't force myself to move. It was entirely possible that the moment I opened my eyes would no longer be in that cold room. Remnants of Sachiko's presence still lingered about, along with something of a tre of tremendous importance. As such, I remained still in the darkness. Sorry. After waiting for a while, I started feeling like I was already hearing it. I could hear it, but my brain refused to comprehend or even process it. I continued to wait. After some more time, I lost sense of how long I'd been doing this. I found myself assaulted by drowsiness, trying to interfere with my mission. When I pulled my consciousness away to escape it, I heard the voice again. Why not go to sleep already? I'll forget a lot of things if I fall asleep now. You'll forget a lot anyway. I felt Tashiko's hand on my cheek as I made a sulking face. I wonder what happens when people die. No idea. It's up to God, I suppose. I don't really believe in one, though. Hmm. I'd rather you decide it for me. Gosh darn it, Takako. Hmm. Sajiko fell in thought. They say people remain in the hearts of their loved ones, and I agree. When I think about what, what you'd think, you appear inside my head. I'll keep thinking about you even when you know more, so you'll still be here inside me. What kind of place would that be? A great place. You'll live in a port town by a beautiful sea. <laughs> it's quiet enough, the air tastes nice. Every season is perfect for reading. <laughs> Am I going to move there? Yes. There's only nice people living there, so they'll treat you very well. <laughs> Sounds like Wonderland. I suppose you could call it that. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. That sounds nice. Tell me more.
I turned the direction of Sachiko's voice and opened my eyes. However, her face was all blurry in the dim light. I couldn't make it out. Okay, I heard her voice. Imagine watching somebody you love slowly waste away. <laughs> no wonder she went bananas. <laughs> if she hadn't gone kind of crazy and let herself believe these people were still in her life, I don't know if she could have made it. I don't know if I could have made it. <laughs> Every day would be a battle just to see if I could even keep myself going. It's almost worse than having them suddenly taken from you. <laughs> because you'd just see it coming a mile away and there'd be nothing you could do. <sighs> so give them a place in your heart. When I opened my eyes, I was in Kozo's room. I was standing in front of a bed without a canopy. Tears rolling down my cheeks. My last memory was that of regret. Sachiko was the one most in pain, yet I ended up relying on her again. And she took that heavy load on her shoulders to feed for me with a gentle smile. Patches of orange sunlight illuminated my knees. The cold had abated as if it were never there to begin with. The, pa the pain and sickness I felt were completely gone, too. I looked at my shadow on the bed and felt a sharp pain before my behind my eyes. As seen from earlier, I kept flashing into my mind. I had a recollection of the bed Sachiko and I lay on, and I'd already remembered the clock before ever seeing it. That was, without a shred of a doubt, our bedroom. We bought an apartment in the suburbs. It was about a 30 minute drive from our office. The memories of that day we spent together came flooding back into my mind like water crashing through a collapsing dam. That was way too much information for a mere dream. Besides, there was even nothing amb ambiguous about those memories. I remembered everything with perfect clarity. My heart was racing in my chest. I gave up on processing everything for now and took a deep breath. As I looked around the room, I remembered the sanatorium. My thoughts then moved to Mayuka, Sanae, and Kozua, and finally to Narasaki. Sachiko mentioned my name in returning memories. I mentioned that name. Narasaki knew Sachiko. And it was possible she was still here. Once I had calmed down, I hurried out of the room. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I probably should stop here, but I don't think I can. I descended the spiral staircase in a hurry. Come on. Come on. One last hurrah. There she is. As I emerged into the lobby, I nearly crashed into Narasaki, who was standing in front of the phone. Narasaki noticed me and turned around. Did you run into a polar bear upstairs or something? Her hand was resting on the phone receiver. Have you finished your walk yet? I was about to leave. I want to ask you something about what we discussed earlier. Or can't you even spare a minute? There's like a glass of the stained glass in the door rather than the clock. I can stay while it's still bright outside. I'd rather not drive through the mountain roads in the dark, you know? So what's bothering you? Sachiko! You implied you didn't know her, but you do, don't you? What makes you think that? Narasaki shrugged. I remember. Narasaki is the name of the doll Sachiko used to play with. And you look a lot like it, too. And it's the same Narasaki sent Sachiko's diary to me. You can't be unrelated. I wouldn't make- it wouldn't make sense. Narasaki slowly inhaled a breath and looked at the floor. I couldn't quite make out her face in the already dimming li li dimly lit lobby. Her expression seemingly teetered between relief and exasperation, but I couldn't be sure. You are correct. I do know her. Why did you act like you didn't? I wanted you to remember it by yourself. You still could have said something! 
Narasaki shook her head. There would have been no point if you couldn't remember her yourself. If anything, I said I said it had if anything I said it caused you to remember something, it would have ended up distorting my subjective viewpoint point of view. It wouldn't be your genuine memory, and these kinds of uncertain things are first are the first to be taken away by your illness. Your Sachiko and my Sachiko are different. In order to remember your own Sachiko, you had to recall your memories by yourself. That's why I avoided saying anything about her. All I could do was unobtrusively guide you toward the key to your memories. I understood what she was trying to say. Even back when I read that diary, there were times when I wasn't entirely sure if those were really my memories or just my imagination. And when I started thinking like that, I'd grow anxious and uncertain. Once you forget something for good, you cannot be sure about it anymore. Thanks to you, I remember something very important. However, some of the stuff I remembered is pretty crazy, which is why I'm so stumped right now. Narsaki spoke up while I was trying to look for a better way to articulate my thoughts. What do you remember, exactly? I'm pretty sure I remember more or less everything about our lives together. But those memories don't explain why I'm here. It's almost like I have two different selves, each with its own separate set of memories. I feel like the time I spent living with Sachiko was akin to a dream that felt very real. Nosaki calmly listened to my rambling. Maybe you really don't know her. For all I know, she could be a figment of my imagination. Um. Okay, so. May, uh, okay, that was, that was Sachiko. Takako trying to talk. Finding it hard to believe, Narasaki, uh, Narasaki asked. But if you remember that, uh, but if you remember that much, we can always talk about it later. Narasaki turned back toward the phone. She picked up the receiver and pushed a coin into the slot. Maybe she's still there, she said while turning the dial. I drew closer to the phone. Narasaki held up the receiver in front of me. When I took it and pressed it against my ear, I could hear a long beep. No way. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Last chapter. Last chapter. Oh no. Do I continue or do I stay? Do I do do, 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 do this? Are we just gonna do this? Do we have one more episode? Maybe. Maybe we, I think we have to stop here. I I really don't like it when my episodes get too long. I've made ex exceptions, but they're usually pretty extreme. And we have something to look forward to. I'm guessing the last episode. I mean, sometimes these chapters are long, sometimes they're short, but I think maybe we can hammer out the last one in one last episode next week. Oh, plus my emotions are kind of... I don't know if I can handle it anymore right now. I was freaking crazy. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. But they might be able to talk to each other. I just don't know, like, because this looks like it's back in the past. Like, Sachiko, like, left, didn't she? So is this, like, back in time? I don't know. We'll have to see. Anyway. Freaking nuts, man. Nuts. Oh, my gosh. Just that realization, that feeling. Like, seriously, this game man manipulates my emotions in ways I never thought possible. Like, I just don't understand how it can be doing that. Like, I was getting sad about stuff. Stuff. <laughs> Didn't even know what it was. And then it just comes and just like, oh, yeah, yeah, you felt like you thought you were getting sad here. Let's just hammer you with a train of memories. Boom. Let's just watch you watch her whole, like, existence crumble around her face. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> so crazy. I I don't know. I, I want to, I want I, I have no idea how this is going to resolve itself, but I'm, I'm, it's fine. Maybe there's also, like, a, like, a, prologue after this too like this is the last official chapter but there's like a prologue or a tips that'll be left over we'll see but i think we might be close to done my guess is one more episode because i have a feeling i'm going to want to see this chapter through all the way even if it's kind of long um but we'll find out we'll find out right <laughs> this trip's this this journey is almost over but thanks for being here thanks for the customary watching me ball my eyes out what an insane trip this is going to be. 
Um, I do, when I finish this, I want to plan a little podcast that we can do where we can talk about this. I know there's a whole lot of people who are, like, super, like, attentive to this series compared to, like, Mob Love, obviously. But, like, I still would love to have, if there's a few of you who are interested, we could, like, I can have you on Discord. We could all chat and kind of, like, discuss the story together, uh, broadcast it live, and hopefully, like, get more people interested in reading it themselves. Because this is a good one. This is a, this is one of those ones where, like it looks like it's kind of like a like a cheaper like if it has almost like a knockoff type feel to it. But my gosh, the writing is freaking incredible. <sighs> but yeah, enough of my rambling. Oh, I can't wait to hear your guys' thoughts. Do you like weepy me? Oh man, I barely was keeping it together. I have no idea how my voice work was doing at all. Probably awful like usual, but whatever. <sighs> Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you so much for sharing this journey with me. And we're probably almost done. Like, finally. I've been calling the end forever now. But I think when it's his last chapter, it's pretty much telling me it's almost over. So we might have our grand finale next week. It could be the week after that. We'll find out. But anyway, regardless, I look forward to talking to you. And until the next video, watch with me or whatever you see me in next. I'll see you there.